Today, I'm going to talk about preventing pesticide poisoning in farm work, both the public health and legal considerations for pesticide related illness in farm workers. And I'm going to talk about issues that apply in clinical settings so that you could potentially really use this in your work. I want to acknowledge that the University of Illinois Chicago, where I am, stands on the original homelands of the Miami Three Fire Peoples, the Bodawadmi, Ojibwe, and Odawa, who have been stewards of this land for generations. Illinois is also home to a diverse nat native community of more than 75,000 tribal citizens, many of whom live in the Chicago area. So I'm gonna start out telling you about some cases to orient you to this whole realm. Uh, the first is two farm workers with a skin rash. The first is a 23 year old female farm worker and the second, her 48 year old father. They were attending a health fair organization a health fair that was organized in the parking lot of the hotel where they were housed. They approached a table where health screenings were offered. They showed the community health worker their skin and asked if she knew what the problem was and how to care for it. The community health worker thought they had contact dermatitis, both of them. The daughter on the bottom, in the bottom picture had an, acute ca had an acute case and the father had a longstanding case of chronic dermatitis with lichenification. It wasn't clear if the daughter had an allergy or just irritation. The CHW asked what crops they worked with and if they were exposed to disinfectants or pesticides. She offered them either a telemedicine appointment or a visit to the clinic. Here's another case of a two month old infant who was exposed to pyrethroids. A farm worker family was living next to fields where pyrethroids were being sprayed on a windy day. Uh, their child sleeping in the house suddenly became agitated with apparent difficulty breathing. An ambulance was called, the child was taken to the hospital. He was diagnosed with bronchospasm secondary to pesticide inhalation. And just to say that the vast majority of domestic poisonings by pyrethroids are of little or no severity, but and in more than half the cases, there are no symptoms. However, in cases of inhalation of the aerosol in a confined environment, there's a risk of bronchospasm in sensitive subjects, which this baby was. This is a very big problem storing uh, workplace chemicals in food containers. Here's a case of Paraquat storage in 2010. A 44 year old man mistakenly drank Paraquat, which he thought was fruit juice because of where it was stored. He developed difficulty breathing and he vomited blood. He was admitted to the hospital intensive care unit uh, where he died 20 days after aggressive treatment. And here's a quite a similar case of a 49-year-old man who took a sip from his coffee cup, which he'd poured in which he'd poured Paraquat because the product's bottle was deteriorating. He realized his mistake as soon as he drank it and he went straight to the emergency department. At that time, he started vomiting and uh, had cold, cold sweats. He uh, was given doses of activated charcoal and his stomach was pumped. Morphine was given to him because he had pain in his esophagus and he was intubated to support breathing function on day four. He had very aggressive care, but he died on day 10. Paraquat's a pretty bad actor. So what I'm trying to do today is to show you how to take an occupational history and convince you that that's very relevant and important for you to do. I want to explain to you how to obtain and interpret and use safety data sheets, how to use uh, your state poison control center and their online resources to assist in patient management. And I wanna tell you about government agencies for reporting and enforcement. So why should you care about detecting acute and chronic pesticide poisoning? First of all, it's very common as you could see, and I'll show you some numbers in a few minutes. Pesticides cause acute and fatal illnesses 
They also cause birth defects and chronic diseases. Uh, there are a lot of studies now showing the relationship between pesticide exposure and cancers and Parkinson's disease and respiratory diseases and cardiovascular uh, diseases as well. Reporting of pesticide poisoning cases is the law in 26 states, and I'll show you how to figure out if your state is one of those and how and where to report. Pesticide poisoning is preventable. So of course, the more we know about it, the better able we are to intervene for prevention. Pesticide poisoning intersects with social determinants. Who gets exposed, how they get exposed is differentially uh, related to people's social determinants, i.e. being a farm worker in this case. Climate change is causing in, in, an increase in pesticide use. So as the climate warms, insects and uh, diseases are moving northward and that's altering the use of, of pesticides, the types of pesticides that are applied. And then of course, worker health and safety is a human right and no worker should be poisoned at work. Let me just convince you a little bit more that you need to know about this. Here are case fatality rates. If you just look at the very bottom line, the summary here, um, in uh, this was the study was done in 2010. There were over 3,000 patients that came to hospitals with pesticide poisoning, and 11.2% of them died. So there's really a big case fatality rate when people become um, seriously ill from pesticide exposure. How about non-fatal cases? There is an average of 23 deaths per year in the United States. Most of those are suicides uh, from drinking pesticides that are around, but clinicians diagnose 10 to 20,000 poisonings each year in the United States. This is the situation globally, and I'll just uh, point you to the very bottom line here. So uh, here's Paraquat, that bad actor that we already saw, and the case fatality ratio, that is the number of deaths over the number exposed is 54 for Paraquat. You can see that the median case fatality ratio is quite high for this compared to the other organophosphates that are listed on this slide. What about a poison center? I'm going to shift and talk to you about poison control centers. So there is a poison control center, at least one in every state. I think California has three of them. And if you look at the bottom of this slide, around 60,000 pesticide cases are fielded, calls are fielded by poison centers across the U.S. in each year. So this is for 2021. Uh, uh, tw almost 29,000 were pediatric cases, over 36,000 were adult cases. So uh, now you're probably convinced that this is a big problem in a state. And pesticides cause birth defects. There are many, many studies. I'm pulling from a meta-analysis, which is referenced down here, of 94 studies internationally. Pre- and postnatal exposure to pesticides can be linked to cancers in childhood, to neurological deficits, to fetal death, to inter intrauterine growth retardation, to preterm birth, and a bunch of congenital abnormalities related to the nervous system, the urogenital system, and the cardiovascular system. Parkinson's disease, that's the PD in the middle of the brain right here, is more and more commonly, it, it's increasing in frequency, uh, and incidents in, uh, among people in the United States. And there's quite a bit of evidence for pesticides um, interfering with mechanisms that can lead to Parkinson's disease. And so in the blue all around here are the pesticides that are implicated. The red shows the mechanisms through which they might lead to Parkinson's disease. 
If we take a look at occupational pesticide related illness in the state of Illinois, we do the surveillance for occupational illnesses and injuries in our state. And so we looked at our hospital data, which is ED visits and hospitalizations. And if you look along the bottom here, here are the organ systems that are most affected in visits for, for occupational diseases. Okay, now I'm gonna shift from the medical side a little bit and tell you about the laws and regulations that, that govern uh, the use of pesticides in the United States so that you have an idea of what you might see, who you might call, and how you need to report. The major law that governs this area is FIFRA, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, and that relates to the registration, the distribution, the sale, and the use of pesticides in the United States. And there's their definition of pesticides, which you can read on your own, but that's what they're covering. But I want to point out that there's some fragmentation here. So that's a federal law, but the regulation of spraying pesticides falls to the state, the states, and it involves the state departments of agriculture. And on the bottom, I'm just showing you the, the cl classes of pesticides that are governed by FIFRA. The EPA Worker Protection Standard, um, I, I want to point out now that the Worker Protection Standard is governed by the EPA. So that's a different federal agency. And what the Worker Protection Standard does is it governs um, all applications and ways to protect workers in the case of agricultural work or urban work, even where pesticides are being used. And I want to point out that in this case, the EPA is regulating uh, worker protection as opposed to OSHA, which regulates every other industry. So there's fragmentation here that perhaps doesn't serve workers very well. Um, by the worker protection standard, workers are required to stay out of treated areas during and after application. So the employer may, needs to make sure that that happens. The employer needs to provide proper protective gear and it needs to be worn by pesticide applicators. There needs to be access to supplies for routine and emergency washing in the case of a uh, unexpected exposure. And there's annual safety training uh, for pesticide applicators and for workers that might be exposed, particularly to reduce uh, take home residues. Workers are supposed to have access to information about the pesticides that are used on site. There's supposed to be a list of the pesticides that are being applied, the date and the time, safety data sheets, which I'll tell you about in a second, need to be available for all applied pesticides. Uh, pesticide safety information and emergency contacts need to be listed. And all this information must be provided to workers, to pesticide handlers, and to medical providers if they are asked uh, from a medical provider to provide this information. There are age limits for applicators, employers need to keep records, and there needs to be protection from retaliation and discrimination against workers who complain about exposure. I want to point you to this map. Uh, if you get the slide set, you can see here the uh, uh, URL at the bottom. You can click on your state and you can look at the pesticide exposure require, uh, reporting requirements for your state. So in the light light orange. Those are the states that require reporting. Unfortunately, our state does not require reporting. And if you click on the state when you go to that website, you can find out where and how to report. I wanted to show you uh, a pesticide label and talk a second about reading a pesticide label. There are required um, uh, 
uh, categories of information that need to be put on a pesticide label. Here it says at the top, there, this is a restricted use pesticide. Here's the name of the pesticide. It's in the class of herbicide. And then here's your skull and crossbones on the bottom. But really what you need as a healthcare provider is to know the name of the pesticide. You need the active ingredient. All of this other stuff about treatment, it's about first aid in the field. By the time a patient comes to you, a farm worker comes to you, all that information is not very important. So you really just need the name of the pesticide. Here are safety data sheets. Um, let me show. Let me talk about them and show you what's on them. It has an identifier, which is the name of the chemical, and it has this pictogram, uh, uh, hazard identification pictogram. These are the newest pictograms. There are nine of them from the new um, uh, safety data sheet requirement. And so the two pictograms that we're most interested in are health hazard up here in the top left and the skull and crossbones for acute toxicity in the bottom right. And then it has a bunch of other information like this. But again, by the time a worker comes to the clinic, all this kind of detailed first aid in the field information isn't super important to a clinician. So I'm going to tell and what happened to them when they went to the doctor and so on. Um, farm workers were sprayed overhead while working in July of 2019. There were 95 farm workers. They were detasseling corn in the field. The field was sprayed overhead by a crop duster. The farm workers ran off the field. Their clothes were doused in pesticides. They said that their eyes and their throats burned and some of them had trouble breathing. One, so, someone from the area called the Illinois Department of Agriculture, who called the Illinois Department of Public Health, and the workers were referred to the hospital. Some of the workers went to the hospital, and the hospital called the Illinois Poison Center. The Illinois Poison Center got safety data sheets, and they gave advice to the doctors who were caring for the patients at the time they were in the emergency department. So that's how that case went. And all of that is to say that poison control centers in every state are really important. They're very valuable uh, resources and you should use them. Their goal is to reduce the incidence and the severity of poisonings. They uh, are available 24 seven. They provide immediate telephone treatment recommendations. They also provide professional education for healthcare and public health personnel. So you can go on the website of your poison center and you can get CME credits, for example, for some of their uh, training programs. They also conduct pesticide poisoning surveillance. They report all of the cases that they get to a central system, the NPDS system, which shares with the CDC, and I'll show you that in a moment. They do focused research and they can help with accessing safety data sheets and product labels, as I described in that overhead spraying case that we had in Illinois. They have a hotline, so you can either use the area code of your own state, or if you call 800, you'll get redirected to your state. They're staffed with pharmacists, nurses, and doctors who are very highly trained. They help community residents and clinicians manage patients, so they'll give advice to people in the community. You can uh, use their resources to give out to your patients to call them if they have issues around pesticides or other problems. Poison control centers field over 75,000 calls each year's, year that are related to pesticides. And again, much of the surveillance data, much of what we know about pesticide cases comes from poison control centers. And again, they offer a lot of online training programs. Here's, uh, if you click to their, through their, to the, through them, uh, the poison, uh, th this gets eventually to this website. Uh, this is the Environmental Health Tracking Network. It's a data visualization website. It um, 
uh, can be used for intervention and they people also publish papers and do reviews using this. So feel free to go there. The web address is down at the bottom um, if you take a look at the slides. And again, there are around 60,000 calls. So what happened with that overhead spraying case that I told you about? Legal Aid Chicago represented the workers in a lawsuit. They, it was found that the company, the employer, violated the Migrant and Seasonal Agricultural Worker Protection Act, MSPA, and also the Fair Labor Standards Act. And these were the problems. They failed to provide the workers with facilities to wash off the chemicals. They ordered the workers to go back into the fields while the fields were still wet. They lied to the workers about what had been sprayed. They didn't initially pay for the workers' hospital bills. And finally, they were fined for battery and assault of the workers. So the case settled against the workers' employer. Uh, there are ongoing lawsuits against the companies that did the spraying. And as an outcome of this event and all the publicity, Illinois passed a law to increase fines for illegal spraying. You can read more about all this um, if you go to the websites listed here. And then I'm going to tell you about H5N1 just a little bit. There are three cases here. The first one is a dairy worker in Texas who had conjunctivitis, uh, inflammation of his eye. Case two was a dairy worker in the state of Michigan also who had conjunctivitis. And his co-worker is case three, who actually had a flu-like illness with cough, shortness of breath, headaches, sore throat, nasal congestion, rhinitis, um, and, and actually developed a longer-term illness. Since I put the slide set together, there are quite a few more workers. I think there are over 50 workers now that are described as uh, contracting H5N1. So you should be looking for information put out by public health if you're caring for workers that work in dairy. And of course, you should be asking your patients in uh, your work in your clinics what kind of work that they do so you know whether you should be looking out for this. There you go. Let me talk for one moment about taking an occupational history. There are a lot of different forms and a lot of different ways to do this, but it doesn't have to be so complicated. You can take a look at these forms. I uh, gave you the, the web address at the bottom for the form on the left side. Um, you could use these forms. You could have a medical assistant in your clinic, for example, ask an occupational history while the patient is in the waiting room. But if you want to be really brief and ask an occupational history of all of your patients, not only farm workers, these are two questions that you can ask them. These are tested questions that yield good information. You wanna ask them about the industry that they work in and their occupation. What kind of business or industry have you worked in during the past year? And you can list examples that are common in your local jurisdiction. And the second is what kind of work do you do? For example, are you a nurse, a janitor, a cashier, a livestock worker, a crop worker, a nursery? worker. You could change the time frame, of course, and ask um, more about the last season or currently, sort of depends on the circumstance. Here's a very good form that I was able to adapt from ATSDR. There's the web link to the form. Um, and this just asks a very brief um, history of their work that you can fill in here on one page. And then this is a checklist you can ask, are you exposed to this? Are you exposed to this, 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 this? Here's pesticides on the list. Okay, let me tell you about a third case. So um, this is a case of farm workers at an FQHC in a rural area. This is a 32 year old woman and her husband. 
Uh, she, they, they are having fertility problems. They've been together for 10 years trying to have a child. She had three miscarriages, but no other pregnancies. They're Spanish speakers from Mexico. They immigrated to the U.S. 10 years prior to the visit. They have no known medical problems. Everything's negative. They live in a mobile trainer. And so, of course, what else would you want to know? And you want to know what work they do. What are they exposed to? Of course, you do all the usual medical tests, but you also want to know this by history. What is fertility and fecundity dependent on? Fer fertility is ability to have kids and fecundity is the number of kids one produces. These are the uh, typical abnormalities of uh, fertility, which you're probably well versed in, uh, abnormal sperm, low sex hormones, uh, DNA problems, um, uh, stillbirths, chromosomal abnormalities. But just to, to say that working on a farm, living on a farm, and exposure to pesticides has been shown to cause abnormalities in fertility um, alone. So there are many, many studies that you can go to now. And I wanna remind you though, that there are a lot of environmental causes of uh, fertility and fecundity problems. And um, here are all of the environmental causes listed here, pesticides down here on the left. So a way you can get more detailed information about a person's exposures over time is to use this calendar kind of history. This, is, this example is in the published literature and obviously it's from a long time ago, but you can ask people what they were doing at different times. You can use a, a calendar, like a five-year calendar and ask about weddings, funerals, childbirth, events that happened. If you're looking at a migrating workforce and you're trying to understand where and when and for how long they were exposed, you could map their exposures or their jobs onto a calendar such as this. There are a lot of data that show that perinatal and early childhood exposure to pesticides uh, 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 can be captured on a calendar. I won't go into great details on this, but you can study this at your leisure. And you also can look up exposure hazards related to specific occup occupations. I have the web link down here. So this is ONET, which is a U.S. Department of Labor website. And you can go to onetonline.org and you get here and you can type in the occupation of the patient that you're seeing and it'll give you a whole uh, drop-down menu of items that tell you what kind of work the person does and potentially what they're exposed to in their workplace. Here's a format for thinking about hazardous exposures at work. You could list the job or occupation in, in more detail, not farm worker, but what is the farm worker doing? They're detasseling corn, they're milking cows, whatever. And then you can think about the hazards in that workplace according to these five categories, all, all, the ha all hazards, all occupational hazards fall into these categories, chemical hazards govern pesticides and these others. Biological is bacteria, fungi, H5N1 in our scenario, in our case. There are physical hazards, noise, UV light, etc. Biomechanical hazards, these are really prominent and prevalent. Workers want to know about this, of course. They'll come to you frequently with uh, musculoskeletal abnormalities and this also includes accident hazards or injury hazards, fall from ladders, use of machines and so on. And then psychosocial hazards is another uh, wastebasket for long hours, shift work deadlines, 
being paid by the out by the product, not by the hour, working with an angry boss, low wages, more than one job. So you can collect information in these five categories pretty easily, I think. I want to help you anticipate exposure scenarios, mechanisms of pesticide exposure. Um, you probably saw this in school, uh, routes of entry of chemical hazards, pesticides in this case. You can get absorption through the skin and mucous membranes by contact. People ingest pesticides either intentionally or unintentionally, and inhalation is also a common route of exposure. And so when you see spraying here, this is like the case that I showed you. People standing underneath would get this stuff on their skin, probably also inhale it. So on the top right, you see an individual with a backpack sprayer who is walking into his uh, spraying field. And backpack sprayers are also potentially problematic because oftentimes people pour pesticide, the pesticide chemical into the reservoir here. So here's a diagram of this. Um, here's a guy filling the sprayer without gloves. And here's a guy pouring a chemical into the, into the reservoir while the worker is wearing the backpack. Pesticides are also applied to livestock to suppress house flies and other pets, pests. So there are residues there and you see this worker up on the right walking with uh, while, while holding uh, pigs without gloves on. And so he could be exposed in that way. Pesticides are present in feed. They end up in animal waste as mm -hmm. well. Um, they also contaminate drinking water uh, and soil. They get in eggs. So uh, here's a guy also handling eggs with no gloves. So that can be problematic for him. You'll see this graphic in the next talk, the next webinar that we give. This is a graphic showing farm workers about use of pesticides um, and pesticide residues that can get on their clothing uh, and they can carry it home. This was uh, produced by Maggie Acosta and uh, colleagues in our Ag Center, the Great Lakes Center for Farm Worker Health and Wellbeing. And uh, it was very vetted by farm workers themselves. You can get copies of this if you want them. And then just to point out that there are many opportunities for prevention. So of course there's primary prevention, there's a healthy worker, there are laws that prevent exposure to that worker. And of course that's the best way to prevent pesticide poisoning. There's secondary prevention where the person got exposed and uh, you can take care of that person medically, clinically, um, by using the poison center and treating them appropriately. And tertiary prevention is the worst way to prevent this, which is when they have severe illness as a result of it and their illness is irreversible. Death falls into that category. So today I've talked to you about the importance of taking an occupational history and how to do that how to obtain and what you need to know about safety data sheets, how you should use the Poison Control Center and their online resources to assist you in pa patient management. And also I showed you the map that Migrant Clinicians Network has where you can get information about accessing government agencies for both reporting and enforcement. I invite you to connect with us. Please feel free to contact me via email, go to our website and so on, uh, photograph our, uh, our, code, our codes here um, and get in touch with us. Thank you.